Thank you, Russ, for your update and for your prayer. And Happy New Year to you all. It's wonderful to see. We closed off 2021 rather green. We had a green Christmas, but glad to see we've got snow on the ground. Now, some of you might have dreaded cleaning your cars this morning. I certainly did not. Well, if you're watching for the first time or watching online, my name is Stephen Martins, and uh, I have the privilege of serving on staff here at the church with Harbor. I'm also the church planner for Sevilla Chapel, uh, Harbor's daughter church. And uh, over the past couple of weeks, uh, together as a community, we've been working through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, We've been working through that narrative, but today we're going to take a bit of a pause And we're going to jump into the Gospel of Matthew in order to cover an event, a particular event in Jesus' life that is not covered in the Gospel of Luke. So this is very much complementary to the series that you've already been working on and through, and one that is timely given our date on the calendar. So let me explain a little bit about that. Well, the new year having started... Some of us may have started to put away the Christmas decorations. I mean, some of you may have done it right away if you don't like Christmas at all. Some of you uh, may leave it up until summer. I don't know. Everyone has a different uh, tradition. But for our family, we still have our Christmas tree and our nativity scene up, and we're not likely to put that away until after Epiphany. What is Epiphany, you might ask? Epiphany is actually a Christian holiday, but it's been forgotten amongst most of the churches in the West. According to the church calendar, Epiphany was celebrated on January 6th, so it's only about four days away, which for us commemorates the visit of the Magi who came bearing gifts for the Messiah and the anointed King. To explain in much much more simpler terms what epiphany means, it is the manifestation of God. It is God revealing Himself to the Gentiles or to the non-Jews, to people outside of Jerusalem and Israel. In order for us to understand the significance of epiphany, we need to turn to the text of Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. So if you have your Bibles, you can open this up, or you can can turn it on on your devices, and we can just take this verse by verse. And we're going to read the first two verses, and it reads as follows. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it arose, and have come to worship him. In the beginning of the gospel account of Matthew, uh, he introduces us to Jesus Christ through the lineage. But here he introduces a few more characters in the historical birth narrative. After Jesus had been born, and after the shepherds had come to visit Jesus, we are told that wise men from the east had come inquiring about this king of the Jews. And Herod who was the king of the Jews in those times, had heard about the wise men's inquiry. Who were the wise men, first of all? They were not kings like what we read or what we sing in that famous Christian carol, you know, we three kings from Orient come. That's as much singing I'm doing for you this morning. Josh, you cannot recruit me for the worship man. Some of us have assumed these were kings because of the gifts that they bring. But Matthew does not refer to them as kings. The only kings that are mentioned by title are Herod and baby Jesus. Now, these wise men are said to come from the east, and some scholars and commentators have said that these could be from Arabia, Persia, or Babylon. The predominant consensus, what mostly everyone believes, is that these are Babylonians because the title wise men is also found in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And it's used to refer to those who were astrologers and practitioners of pagan magic. So that scene when Nebuchadnezzar is asking for the wise men to interpret his dreams, he's asking for all those practitioners. They could be considered sorcerers, magicians, or warlocks, whatever you want to refer to them as, which meant that they were certainly pagan and would have been condemned by the law of Moses for meddling with forbidden spiritual things. And yet, here they are, searching for the king of the Jews. How did they learn about this prophecy? How did they learn about this promise? 
Remember that the Jews had been in exile in Babylon and Persia many years before, and it would have been natural for this messianic hope which all of them had and shared to become known to Babylonian culture, to their captives, to their captors. And these wise men would have learned from Jewish sources about the oracle of the Lamb. If you're not familiar with that, it's actually in the book of Numbers. And it reads, a star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Now, as astrologers and magic practitioners, they would have sought the stars for meanings and events at a level far more advanced than our newspaper horoscopes, but nonetheless just as vain, just as fallen, and just as futile. By God's mercy, however, He allowed them, through their interpretation, to come to the conclusion that the King of the Jews had been born. It reminds me of that one time in math class in my high school years where I used a series of random mathematical formulas to get to the right answer of a question. And it was a question where I had no idea what I was doing or what I was supposed to do. I was terrible at math, so I thought, I'm just going to wing it because if I can just get one point, that'll be good for my final mark. So I made an attempt, and my math teacher later told me that it, I went about it all wrong. It was terrible. But somehow, by some fluke, I had arrived at the right answer. So she gave me 0.5 points for that question. She couldn't understand it, neither could I, but it was very much like that for the wise men. But it was all orchestrated by God. You know, we're not told how many wise men there were. There could have been two. There could have been 12. But we all assume three because they came with three gifts. But all that we do know with certainty is that it was plural. There was not a wise man, but wise men. And they had come to worship this king because they knew that this king was unlike any other king. This king had been long foretold. This king had been announced by a rising star. This king must be divine and sent by God. Well, what follows in the next two verses is Herod's reaction. For those of you who are unfamiliar with ancient history, particularly pertaining to the Jews in ancient Rome and their relation to Rome, Herod was nothing more than a puppet king. The Jews had demanded a king, and the Romans conceded to this demand in an attempt to keep the peace, the Pax Romana. But this would not be a king of the Jews' choosing, but rather one controlled by Rome to ensure the supremacy of Caesar and the Roman government. I'll share a few more details about Herod shortly, but first, his reaction as the appointed king of the Jews. Verse 3 says that Herod was troubled. He was troubled. And the text says that all Jerusalem with him. Why? Consider the title that Herod uses, the Christ, in the verse. The Greek word for Christ is Christos. It means the anointed one, the king. When David in the Old Testament was anointed by the prophet Samuel, what was he being anointed for? To be king of the Jews, to be king of Israel. The Christ was the long-awaited king, the anointed one of God. Herod, in this scene, is very much like King Saul, and Jesus was like David. One was picked by man because the people wanted a king like Saul, and the other picked by God. But the stakes are a lot more higher this time. Here we see Herod as a sinful human being and Jesus as the sinless son of God. Herod's rule was threatened because of this baby was, in fact, the king. If this child is, in fact, the king, then that means that Herod is not the king. And this threatened all of Jerusalem, for a new king would upset the peace. It could initiate a revolt against Rome. It could provoke Herod to perform some evil act to preserve his rule. In fact, he would. And the whole religious establishment could be overthrown one way or another. So there was not much certainty as to what would happen. There are a lot of unknowns for them to consider, but there was certainty that something would happen. And this provoked fear as opposed to hope in Jerusalem. Consider what unfolds in the next few verses, 5 and 6. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, 
For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rules of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. The prophecy of Micah cited by the Jewish scribes and priests. They know well enough where that Christ would be born. But what I find most surprising is not that they knew this, because they should have known this with all their education. It was that they did nothing with that information. What does it matter to know the Word of God and yet do nothing to put that Word into practice, to obey, to respond to its call to worship? Well, they, along with all of Jerusalem, simply remained indifferent and made no effort to seek out this king whom the Magi searched for. But Herod was certainly not indifferent. He was hostile to this news. And for this reason, he plotted in secret, and he summoned the wise men, as we read in verse 7. Because he had learned that this Christ would come from Bethlehem, he sent them there to do the searching themselves. He wasn't going to do the hard work. He sent them to do it. And if they were to find him, he asked that they would communicate this news back to him. What was the motive that he gave, according to verse 8, that I too may come and worship him? Herod was lying through his teeth, but the wise men believed him and followed his instruction to find the boy. Verses 9 to 10 state that the star which they followed rested over where Jesus was in Bethlehem. And when they found the boy, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. There's more. Consider verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'm going to go into what these gifts represented, but first, consider who it was who sought Jesus and fell down to worship. Was it Herod? Certainly not. Was it the scribes and priests? Not them either. Was it all of Jerusalem since they knew? They didn't seem to care. It was a group of pagan Gentiles from a land in the east, a people who had not received the Old Testament, a people who were not called God's people before, a people who had, were steeped actually in the dark arts of sorcery. Not the ideal worshiper, you might think, but quite the contrary. Here was a group that would be the least expected to travel such a far way to find the Christ in order to worship Him. This is nothing less than the beautiful picture of God's grace because it pleased the Father to reveal the Son to the world, to those who had no prior relationship with Him. What we witness in this text are the doors of salvation opening to the world where no one would be too far off to be saved, where no one would be disqualified from receiving the grace of God. This is epiphany, the manifestation of God, the revelation of God to the world. As the angel of the Lord said to the shepherds in Luke chapter 10, verses 10 to 11, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It doesn't say just for the Jews. It doesn't say just for a sect of the Jews. It says for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, what about these three gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were not inexpensive gifts. They're not gifts I would bring to a birthday party. And they were certainly not gifts to give a child. But they were intentional and they were prophetic. The gold is perhaps the most obvious in terms of its meaning. What metal is most associated with kings? Gold. The wise men knew that Jesus was the king of the Jews, but they also knew that he was the king of kings. For why else travel such a far distance if he wasn't their king? If he wasn't the king of all? The giving of the gold acknowledged Jesus' right to rule. As for the frankincense, this testified of the priestly office of Jesus because such incense was used in temple worship. 
Frankincense, for example, was often mixed with oil in order to be used by the priests for anointing. It was also part of the meal offerings to God, such as that of thanksgiving and that of praise. The very giving of frankincense acknowledged Jesus as the great high priest, as the perfect mediator between man and God. And as for the myrrh, well, this might have been more of a somber gift. Myrrh was used for embalming. Why on earth would you offer a spice for embalming to a child? If the wise men were celebrating the birth and life of the king, why give a gift associated with death? It would be like offering a coffin as a gift to a toddler. If you did that to me, I wouldn't be your friend. Clearly, the wise men were not trying to insult Jesus or his parents, his earthly parents. They had been illuminated by the Spirit of God because by giving myrrh, they were recognizing the prophetic nature of the ministry of Jesus. In other words, they knew according to the prophecies the king had come in order to die for the sins of mankind. And here were the very first Gentiles, those who were not Jews, to not only testify of this fact, but to submit themselves to this gospel. They were saying that Jesus' death would also apply to them. Here was Jesus, the king, priest, and prophet, the divine son of God. If they had believed Herod's words, they must have been excited, overjoyed to share this news with him. But the Lord intervened for, as verse 12 reads, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. That's as far as we'll go with the text today. You know, as I've reflected on this passage, I decided to title the sermon, Get Off Your Throne, because that is what this text is challenging us to do. Ever since man fell in Adam, he has sought to be his own king. We have sought to be our own king. And this is in part natural because Adam and Eve were the king and queen of creation. Their descendants were to be kings and queens. That is to say, they were called to govern God's creation through all of our functioning according to God's will, according to God's word. But the sin that marred the image of God in man also corrupted our own functioning. And now instead of upholding God's truth and steering all things towards obedience to Christ, man has instead sought to govern according to his own arbitrary standards. Each person has sought to build their own kingdom. Each person is his or own regal authority. And collectively, in an attempt to blot out God's kingdom, man has also sought to redefine reality in so many different ways. This has included man's origin, the composition of the nuclear family, the institution of marriage, the sexual identity of a person. We see it all over the news. Man is king and his word rules. In this second chapter of Matthew, we're presented with two kings. One is Herod, who is representative of man's fallen nature, while the other is is Jesus, the divine Son of God, who is king over all things created, seen and unseen. What king did the Jews prefer? Based on what we read in the text, the people made their choice. By not running out to Bethlehem, by not running out to, to this small town to find this promised king, they chose a king who had no rightful claim to kingship. In fact, the people chose a madman who had slaughtered the remnants of the dynasty before his, who put to death half of the Sanhedrin, the religious authorities, who killed 300 court officers, who executed his wife and mother-in-law and three sons, who even went as far as to kill noblemen at the time of his own death so that the people would be forced to mourn instead of rejoicing over his death. Herod was a terrible and cruel man. He was quite literally a monster. But does the sin in man's heart make him any different? Who do you choose as your king? Of course, those of us who are in Christ today have had to renounce this sinfulness. We've renounced this waywardness. We've, we've had to lay down our twisted crowns in order to surrender to this true king 
because there's only one whose word is absolute and whose authority is unquestionable. And yet, for many of us, our comprehension of the kingship of Jesus is still very much impoverished. We look at the world and we see the reaction of the people and of the fallen king. Some are indifferent to the reign of Jesus. Others are hostile, as we can see in the public place, whether that be the atheists and skeptics of our age or even the unbelieving elected politicians, whoever that may be. There are people who are either indifferent and people who are hostile. But what if I tell you that we too can be indifferent in the church? How many of us rush, rush to gather on a Sunday to worship our Lord, but then live the rest of the week as if we were the kings and not Jesus? How many of us do what is fitting in our own eyes instead of living according to God's truth? Commentator Douglas Sean O'Donnell provides an excellent example of this. He writes, there are lots of people like that in the church. If you quiz them on Bible trivia, they do just fine. But if you informed them, God in the flesh is just five miles down the street, would you care to join me to meet him? They would shake their heads and say, oh, no, not this time. You know, the NFL playoffs start today. Or, I'm sorry, it's the last day of this unbelievable, unbelievable New Year's sale. Or, I'd hate to miss my Sunday afternoon nap. Maybe next time. What indifference. We live in a world, a church world of indifference. But rest assured, King Jesus is not indifferent towards such false puny, self-appointed royalty. What does the kingship of Jesus entail? It entails more than your private devotions. It entails more than your Sunday or our Sunday gatherings. It entails more than our Bible readings and prayers. The kingship of Jesus entails a total surrender to His reign, a total surrender where everything you do under the sun, every function you perform while you're alive, whether it's a parent, a child, a civil servant, an employer, or an employee, you do as a form of worship unto God and as an act of obedience to His Word. And you're going to explore that more in the All Church series in the weeks to come. Jesus does not want a church that will profess His name with its lips, but not with its life. Let us not be that indifferent church. Harbor has not been known to be that indifferent church. Let us continue on as we have in search of our God and King in every day of our lives. This pandemic has given us sufficient motivation to be indifferent, you know, with the lockdowns, the comforts of home, you name it. But let us not be indifferent to our King. Let us take up the passion and zeal of that Puritan Jonathan Edwards, who said upon receiving a new year, Resolution one, I will live for God. Resolution two, if no one else does, I still will. My brothers and sisters, who is your king? If you're here today or watching online and you do not believe in this Jesus, if you have not surrendered to this Jesus, I urge you, get off your throne, toss aside your crown, turn from your sin, throw yourselves before Jesus like the wise men did, in worship of the Son of God. In Christ, you will have life. In Christ, you will find forgiveness. For in Christ, you have not only a king, but a priest who intercedes on your behalf, and a prophet who reveals God's will to us. This king, priest, and prophet made the sacrifice that no earthly king, priest, or prophet could ever make. He gave his life for the salvation of all those who believe in him, past, present, future. Make this king of king your king. And for those of us who believe, what areas of our lives might we still be refusing to submit to Jesus' kingship? And we can't say, well, nothing at all. We've given it all. Because every day we're being sanctified. Every day we're yielding more to Jesus. In what ways are we being indifferent to his reign? This king descended from glory in order, in order to suffer and die for us. It is only just that he asks us that we surrender everything to him. May our church be one where people say, yes, Jesus is king here, and not only on Sundays, but every day of the week and in every little minute detail of our lives. I close with the words of Abraham Kuyper.
A fine proclamation, I'd say, to begin the new year and to welcome the day of Epiphany. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Pray with me this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank You for this new year. We thank You for the years past. You have been faithful and good and true as Your Word proclaims. And we see that Your goodness will continue for all eternity. Lord, we thank You for Your grace and Your goodness towards us. We pray that we may continue to see Your hand at work in the church. Lord, as we step into this new year, looking to grow in our knowledge of You, looking to grow in our awe of You, looking to be more rooted in Your Word and connected as a community and to be sent out, to lead out, looking to advance Your gospel, we pray may Your Spirit guide us, empower us, and help us to proclaim Your kingship, to reflect in our lives that You are our King, that You've done a great marvelous work of transformation and grace within us. And it is this hope and this joy that we have, not to just be your subjects, but to be your children, God, to be your family, that we can go out and extend that love and that joy with others. May you go forth. May your word be a lamp unto our feet. And may we glorify you this year to come. And may you be with all those who were not able to make it either due to sickness or difficulty. May your hand of help and comfort be with them, with your church. And those who are seeking after you, Lord, would you open their eyes so that they may see the truth. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.